Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's webinar on the Whole Farm Efficiency webinar series. My name is Daniela Gonzalez, and I work with Central New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops team as dairy management specialist. And I'm here to host this webinar, today's webinar. Um, uh, we also want to thank our sponsors for this webinar, Finger Lakes Dairy Services. And well, with that, I want to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Paul Virkler. He's an extension associate with QMPS, Quality Milk and Production uh, Services with Cornell. So with that, Paul, thank you for doing this. And if you want to start sharing your screen. Welcome, everyone. And uh, we'll make sure, Daniela, that's good. You can You can see my screen well. Yep, I can see yeah. your screen. Thank you. Okay. So welcome and thank you to Pro Dairy and Cooperative Extension, the sponsors. Appreciate it. And um today we're gonna we're gonna cover some topics on, on milk quality. And specifically, um, we're gonna talk about um this talk I organized as different major opportunity areas that we see at Quality Milk uh on New York farms. Uh, where there is room for opportunity to improve, to improve efficiency, um, decrease costs, or increased um, production. And so specifically those areas, and we'll cover each one in, in a little bit of depth, not a ton of depth today, but we certainly can answer some questions at the end. Um, but first would be dry and fresh cow mastitis. So we certainly see a lot of that. We're going to talk about a little bit of areas of, um, that we can think about in that area. Then we're going to go to the parlor. And so where are we losing milk and causing deep damage in the parlor? Uh, then we'll go back out to the stalls and bedding management. And then finally, we'll conclude with some ideas on, so loss of premium, specifically, we're gonna to talk today about um, decreasing your somatic cell count in order to get a somatic cell count premium. And last, we'll just touch on a little bit is how to manage um, management of your clinical mastitis cases. And so those are the areas we're gonna cover and, and it should be, uh, so you know what area we're in would be at the top of the screen there. I tried to, to keep it that way. So first we're going to delve into dry cow mastitis. And so why do we care about it? This graph um, out of a publication in 2004 gives us a good idea. And you can see here that mastitis, one of the highest risk factors for a cow is just after she dries off. That's this green line here. And this is the rate of new infections. You can see it spikes pretty high right after dry off. Then during the middle of the dry period, it's pretty low, but then right around the time of calving, it spikes high again. And then it's there throughout lactation, okay? And then she is gets bred, and then we dry her off again, and you see this second spike. And so that's why we're worried. It's one of the highest risk periods in a cow's life is at or around the time of dry off. And this is just an, uh, an example from a herd. Um, they're milking about 1,200. And you can see this is the cases of clinical mastitis and I've plotted it here by the days in milk when that mastitis happened. So this is a count of cases on the y-axis and on the x-axis is how many days in milk was it when the cow happened. And you can see here for this farm, which is not atypical for our New York farms, we have the most mastitis or the highest risk of mastitis is just after they can. So very early fresh. And a lot of this mastitis, again, we link it back to what happened during the dry period. And so that's why we care about it and why we want to think about it and try to help farms get better in this area so we have less mastitis um, coming from the dry period and therefore um, helping in terms of improving uh, the economic situation on dairies. So what I want to do is kind of set the stage. Uh, this is a video here, which I'll let play. And this is a video of a dry off procedure that I took a video on. And certainly this video um, is, is not a good video. It's a video meant to show you how not to do the dry off procedure, what can go wrong. If you notice, unfortunately, he's treating the front teats and he's rubbing his hand against the back teats. Here he, he, he loses the tip on his syringe, right? And now it's on the deck where there's a lot of manure. And then unfortunately, he puts it right back on. And he wipes it with his glove, which, of course, his glove is not sterile either or, or clean because he's been touching, you know, cows. And now he injects it. So we're potentially injecting bacteria into this cow at the time of dry off, um, which is exactly what we don't want to do. 
We want to be a nice, clean, sterile environment, right? And so this is what we've seen on, on some dairies um, is certainly room for opportunity to improve the dry off procedure so that what we're doing at dry off is actually making a difference in a better way rather than causing mastitis. Um, this next video is going to be, that was antibiotic injection. This is a different farm. This is internal teat sealant, um, injecting internal teat sealant. And again, this is an example of what not to do. Again, we're treating the, the front teats first in the parallel parlor with an internal sealant. We should be uh, squeezing off the base of the teat at the top of the teat to keep the sealant down in the teat. Uh, and then on this dairy, for some reason, they actually is massaging the, the sealant out of the teat canal, which is completely uh, wrong and certainly not something we should be doing. And so just showing these videos to give you an idea of what we've been seeing on when we've been looking at uh, dry cow procedures, there's a lot of room for opportunity to make sure we're doing it right at dry off. So we allow the products to do their job and we don't cause harm uh, when we're drying cows off. So just to get some numbers to it, we're not going to go into the detail of the scientific end, but so we assessed um, uh, on 15 different dairies, I assessed 29 uh, employees perform the dry off procedure, and I assessed 19 performing internal sealant administration, and we scored them out of a score of 20, and you can see here for the, the, the treatment with antibiotics, they only scored on average 12.4 out of 20, right, and some were down as low as 5 out of uh, all the way up to 18, but our average was 12, telling us, right, there's quite a bit of opportunity for improvement in our Northeast areas in terms of how we dry cows off. And then if we look at administering internal sealants, there the score was 11.4 out of 20. Again, we should be up in the high 18 or 19 out of 20 if we're doing it right on our dairies. And it shows us there's room for opportunity to improve the dry off procedure. And as we think about the dry off, there, there's different areas and we've kind of done a better job of looking at this now. And, and, and to be honest, we hadn't assessed a lot of dry off procedures. Now we're assessing a lot more and realizing there's quite a bit of opportunity. So we need to think about the dry off environment, where we're drying cows off, how we're doing it. Is it clean? Are we keeping our tubes clean? Um, and then the cow, how are we preparing the cow? When do we sort her? When do we milk her last? making sure when we milk her that she has a good routine, that we don't keep units on manual, because if we cause short-term teat damage, that cow is a lot more sensitive when we go to inject her with antibiotics, right? She'll try to she'll try to kick us. Of course, that means a lot more manure flying around, which is bad for the dry-off procedure, as we know. Uh, certainly thinking about with dairies, how we train our employees for doing the dry-off. Is there a written uh, standard operating procedure? Have, have we done that so that we know what we're training off from? And then how are we evaluating our employees and monitoring our employees over time? And, and so certainly areas that we've seen as opportunities and help farms to improve in these areas, doing a better job of the dry off procedures. Um, as part of that grant, we developed um, a QR code uh, that takes you right directly to a, to a training. It's available in English and Spanish. One of the five modules in there is about doing the actual dry off procedure. So it walks, it walks you through the dry off procedure and how to do it. So for your employees, they can happily do this and train on this, or you can go directly to the, the website there. Um, feel free to use it. It's open to use. We want to basically try to help the industry do a better job of, of uh, training people on how to do the dry off procedure. And that's what part of this grant was. Um, so, and then as well, so that was about dry off procedure. Certainly for the dry cows, we wanna be aware and think about um, is how we're managing the dry in the pre-fresh stalls. For some dairies, right? We're not getting out there as often as we should to walk through those, those stalls and remove the manure from the back of the stalls. Ideally, we're doing it at least two times a day. Some dairies, we can only get it done once a day. Um, but remember, right? the environment where that teat is held is critical in terms of reducing the risk of mastitis. Also, how often are the alleys scraped? How often are stalls bedded? Just trying to make sure we're not forgetting our dry and pre-fresh cows. Um, and we're trying to do as good as we do in our lactating cows in terms of managing their stalls. And then of course the calving area, it's an ongoing thing, making sure the calving area where they're calving, when they start to leak um, that and their teat canals are open, trying to control that environment. And then, of course, after they calve and they're in the fresh cow pen, trying to make sure fresh cow stalls. We know there's quite a bit of leakage. 
there's uterine fluid, there's there's urine, there's milk leakage in those fresh cow stalls. So a lot of the dairies that we want, the fresh cow stalls are some of the dirtiest stalls that we see. And we really should make sure they're the cleanest stalls. Um, so trying to make sure bedding levels are good, we're, we're cleaning them off well, and uh, we're trying to you know, keep our fresh cows in the best environment we can because we know they're the most susceptible cows to mastitis. Their immune status is compromised. They have other metabolic diseases and certainly mastitis can pile on there. So, so thinking through that as the fresh cows as well is important. So, okay, so now we're gonna switch gears. That was dry cows. Um, it's gonna be kind of fast and furious in this presentation, but, but we can pull out some details later in the, there, but I wanted to cover some basic points so we're going to go in the parlor now, and we're going to toss, talk about um, the loss of milk and potential teat damage if we're doing our routine wrong. And I, I put in here, right, poor routines lead to poor milk letdown, poor letdown in the parlor. And we still see quite a few poor routines where we're just not getting good milk letdown in the parlor. And that, that certainly from Michigan State, and I'll show you the data here in a second, um, leads to an actual loss of milk production. So we're not harvesting all the milk we can if we have a poor routine in the parlor. Also, we see it routinely as it also leads to higher risk of teat damage. And of course, the teat, the teat canal is where mastitis happens. So we need to do everything we can to try to keep the teat end happy. And one of the things we can do is do a good routine in the milking parlor. And then um, definitely any Poorly adjusted or poorly maintained milking equipment leads to teat damage as well. So we want to make sure our machines are set right and that we're monitoring them and keeping the maintenance and preventative maintenance on our milking equipment because that, of course, can lead to teat damage as well and therefore increase our risk of mastitis happening when the cow gets milked in the parlor. So what do we see? This is the Michigan data. Their data shows us that if we, a minute delay, so a minute delay or delayed milk ejection at the front end, which means a poor milking routine, and we throw seven pounds of milk away. So pretty big numbers, right? Um, even if we believed half of that, um, it's still large, large numbers of milk that we're not harvesting because we're not supporting good letdown in that parlor. So the bimodal letdown, um, attaching units to cows that aren't stimulating well, right? This is what they're talking about. And this is what they showed out of Michigan in their study is that we're leaving milk in the cows, not harvesting it if we do a poor routine in the parlor. Okay, and what do we see? This this is a graph, just a graphic for you. Um, so this is milk flow on the, on the y-axis here, pounds per minute in this scale, or if you want to think in kilograms, it's over here. She starts milking and then she stops milking and then she starts again. And this is what we call a bimodal or a delayed milk ejection, right? We don't have good flow rates here at the front of milking, and it's due to poor stimulation or poor timing of the routine. And what do we see? We see the milk flow stop in that claw of the cow. We see a cow start to dance during this time period. She starts to become uncomfortable. Sometimes they'll kick units off or we hear a liner slip. And this is all about that the poor routine. So we didn't prep this cow correctly when we put the unit on. And this is what we're talking about with the risk of teat damage and loss of milk production when we see these graphs um, on too many cows on their dairies. So what do we think about timing? Then the timing, really, there's three different timings in the parlor that we got to worry about. How long is our dip on there? We want it on there greater than 30 seconds for the majority of our dips. So making sure that the dip is in contact with the teat for at least 30 seconds. Initial stimulation time, so how long are we stimulating our cows? We're, we're aiming for five to 10 seconds of stimulation. And then what is our lag time? Our lag time means time from the stimulate, when we stimulate the cow until we attach the unit. And on 3X milk dairies, we're aiming for that 90 to 180 seconds, or a minute and a half to three minutes, somewhere in that range. After we stimulate them, we attach the unit, and that's that's the the sweet spot in terms of getting good milk let down on the majority of cows. So what we want to think about for your dairies is is are the issues correct in the timing if we perform the routine correctly? Obviously, we can have individual milkers; they're doing an incorrect routine, but we want to make sure that your routine, as set for your dairies, is hitting these goals, um, and then we'll get on the majority of cows good milk let down, which is what we're aiming for. So just a couple of videos here again, just to kind of help for the visual learners um, is here's a cow, right? This is in a double 23 parlor. 
And that's all the stimulation that cow gets, right? So if we think about letdown and how poorly she's stimulated just by that, it was four stripping, right? But a poor stimulation. This is another one, the rotary. And if you think about this parlor, um, that's all the stimulation that cow gets. It was only wiping was her only stimulation. So very poor stimulation, not a strong signal for that cow to say it's milking time, release oxytocin, let down milk. Contrasting that, this is a double 30 with three people in it. And you can see this routine, they four strip and then they immediately wipe. Um, and so contrast those other two to the amount of stimulation that this cow has in terms of her milk letdown um, on this dairy. So pretty drastic differences. And we see this day after day, the differences between barns in terms of how much stimulation they're getting. And, and it equates to how good of a routine, how good cows let down, and certainly from our research data and stuff, it would support, it also equates to the differences in milk production on some of these dairies. So certainly something to think about. Um, and then if we would look at this, this, you know, bimodal effect, what are the negative effects on the cow? Of course, we see pain, we see her step, we see her move, we see more mastitis. The teat, again, we talked about it. We get that increased risk of damage when we have that low flow and higher vacuum at the start of milking. Parlor, what does it do for that? Longer unit on time because we have periods of no flow rather than high flow. It's certainly less efficient in our parlors. We can't turn them as fast. For the milkers, why do they care? Well, we get more kickoffs, more reattaches, more dirty units, more frustration for them in the parlor when cows are unhappy when they're being milked. And then we go up to the level to the herd managers, certainly more mastitis and, and parlor efficiency would probably be on their table. And then the owner, less milk and more mastitis. Um, so it affects everybody up the chain. And it's why we really focus on it and want to think about making sure the routine in your parlor supports good letdown. Um, so action item, um, you know, if, if you take this, you got to go home and do something different and your home would be your home, time your routine, make sure you're hitting the three critical areas that I outlined. If it's not, let's work on ways to correct it um, because without a good milking routine in that parlor, we're leaving money on the table and we're certainly not going to get those cows milked as quickly and gently and completely as we can if we have a good milking routine. Uh, how could you measure it? Certainly you time it, and that's good. We should do that. If we got parlor data, we use the pounds of milk in the first two minutes. So how much milk we harvest in those first two minutes of unit on time. And the goal is greater than 15 pounds if you're milking 3x or 18 if you're milking 2x. So strong goals. You can look at your parlor data. Um, if you can't or can't find it or whatever, feel free to reach out to us. If you if you think you you know are missing it, it should be in there if you have meters and, and are collecting data. If you don't have parlor data, then certainly the timing is what's going to have to drive it. Um, unless you have somebody come out and put units on there, lactic quarters or flow rate devices or vacuum devices, and then they can show you those graphs and, um, and show you whether the cows are bimodal or not. But the timing should help you if you time it and you're in the correct zone. You're doing, uh, you're doing as good as you can for some of those areas. So just a couple other quick points that we see. We certainly see teat skin condition challenges. Now is the time of year when we see it during the winter with the temperature fluctuations, but certainly we can see it all year. One of these pictures is from a late fall uh, before we started to see major fluctuations. And we see this cracks, these chaps, right? You can think about how unhappy this cow would be or these cows are when we try to put a unit on. If your own fingers, if they crack right on the end, you know how painful they are. Same way with these cows, they're unhappy when they when they get a unit on, they don't like it. We know it's not where we want their skin to be. And so we think about with this, it's about exposure um, to different sort of uh, wind or environmental conditions, um, temperature changes. And then we also think strongly about what we're using for post dip, our, our emollient levels and making sure they're mixed right and, uh, and how much lotion or emollient package is in the is in the dips. And so we can control it um, and we can make it so that cows don't look like this um, because of course these cows are at a high risk of mastitis um, when we see teats looking like this and a lot of teats on some dairies. And then lastly on uh, this area is just the reminder on the vacuum end and the, the equipment end. Certainly we continue to see um, inappropriate claw vacuum and pulsation settings. This morning I was on a dairy and uh, their fresh cow unit that milks the fresh cows was up in a vacuum level of 14 and a, and a half, right? And that should be down 
a lot closer to to maybe 12 and a half. Um, so we're milking our fresh cows at very high vacuums, not what not what we want for a fresh cow in the first time she's milked. And then takeoff settings are on the table, equipment not functioning uh, properly. So pulsators and other um, variable speed drives and stuff like that. Um, and then poor unit alignment would be another equipment thing that we routinely see issues with on, on dairies. So these are opportunity areas, right? If it's happening in your parlor, trying to make it better, so that we lose less money through mastitis because mastitis certainly is the most common disease on dairies and it's and it's one of the most costly diseases on, on our dairies still today, even though we've done a lot of work on it. So, all right, we're gonna switch gears again. We're gonna go over to, to bedding management now and back out into the stalls and think about um, what we're doing on our stalls and how we're bedding cows and, and, and that sort of area. And, you know, the, the take home, um, and I was at the National Mastitis Council meeting last week in Dallas, Texas, and there was a whole talk on this, Dr. Andy Johnson. The take home is poor bedding management, right, leads to dirty cows. Dirty cows leads to increased risks of mastitis. So we're trying to prevent dirty cows, dirty udders, dirty legs, in order to make sure that we don't bring that dirt and manure into the parlor um, and expose the tea dens. Um, because that's where the mastitis gets into the cows through the tea dens. And certainly I put in here, you know, we see this once in a while is, is we, we slack back on bedding when things get tight. And, and it's a bad, it's a bad um, scenario because it starts to start a process where cows get dirtier and the risk of mastitis. And then we start losing money um, because of mastitis. And it really is a it's it's one of the areas where we want to keep our cows clean and dry and keep bedding them. And just a couple examples. This is a dairy um, where we saw this issue. They weren't necessarily doing it on purpose. Uh, they had an issue with their bedding machine. And so, but we see here the top graph is somatic cell count of this dairy. And if we look here around this time period, mid-August, they they had an issue with their bedding machine. And so we saw both a rise in cell count and down here in the bottom is what we call the new infection risk or how many cases of mastitis are we seeing um, on the dairy. And it looks at the cell count and says, what's the risk of mastitis? And so we see this rise here, right? In August to September, we see a rise down here on this new infection risk, which meant we had more high cell count cows and it drove our bulk tank up. And one of the primary drivers of this on this dairy was because our bedding got very low um, because we, we had an issue with, with our bedding machine. And so we see it, we see it on real dairies, right? We see it when bedding levels change, whether it's because, you know, they can't do it or something breaks or something goes down, but we see the increased risk of mastitis when we don't bed our stalls as well as we could. And, and so that's, that's on the table. Um, Here's another dairy, it's a mattress dairy, right? Um, which is, is light on bedding. And so you see the left graph there, you can start to see the, the cows, they're not positioned as well as they could with their back ends right at the curb. So when they, when they manure, it's out into the, the alley. So we're getting manure on these stalls and you can see the right graph here, right? We just don't have enough bedding on here to soak up any milk leakage or any urine or any manure or anything they track into the stall. And therefore, we expose the teats right, to a high pathogen load um, on this dairy. Here was the utter hygiene of this dairy. Our goal of this is to be under 20%. And you can see, right, because of what's going on with their bedding management, we're up into the, you know, this pen group two here was almost 40%. This one's almost 50 and this one's almost 60%. And that's of our cows with dirty udders. So too many cows with dirty udders related to what's going on out there in the stalls. Of course, that means more cows coming in with dirty udders and dirty teats, more work for the milkers, more risk if they don't do a good job of getting those teats clean when we open them up. And so for this dairy, it starts out there in the stalls of increasing the bedding levels um, so that we bring in, in cleaner cows um, to, to open up so that when we milk them. Here's a different dairy. Um, this is a, a dairy that switch beddings. So on the left, this is somatic cell count over time. And you see this, this was a dairy that was on a sand bedding and they switched to a different organic bedding. And you can see the effect it had on somatic cell count, right? Uh, so a major jump 
up to a totally different level when they switch beddings here on this dairy. And it shows you just a good indicator that bedding certainly drives risk of mastitis, especially if we get into situations where the bedding isn't keeping the stalls clean and dry like we want. It's not to say we can't use organic bedding. Certainly we see them used appropriately and used well, but if, if we manage them poorly, um, the risk of mastitis goes up and we can see it here on this dairy very clearly, the change in cell count when we change bedding types um, and, and it stayed high. Right? It's not just a flash in the pain. So, so that's real. Um, here, just to add the, the new infection risk, that same dairy I just showed you with the change, right? You see here in both the heifers and certainly in the mature cows, over the same time period, their risk of mastitis went, went dramatically higher and is at a different level than it was prior to that bedding change. So we, we see that it caused more high cell count cows, more new infections um, because of what was going on out there in the, in the stalls. Um, so certainly a strong relationship on, on this dairy. What other things do we see with bedding management? Certainly, the, this is a sand barn, a deep bed sand barn, and we certainly see um, challenges with cow positioning. You can see on this barn, the cows again are laying further in, and we start to see manure piles, right? Manure and, and urine and, and wetness behind the cows, right near where the udder lays. And, right, we want those cows out so that when they, when they manure, it's out into the alleys and not in the stalls. And how do we change that? Right, we can change that with, with brisket um, brisket pipes, so moving them back so that they're positioned better, closer to the back of the stalls. We don't want the uncomfortable, the big two by 12s or the old things that we used to have for brisket boards. We're now seeing a lot more brisket pipes, so PVC pipes and more of a gentle, lower an indicator, because of course, if we affect cow comfort, that's a negative thing. We don't want to affect cow comfort with these brisket pipes but we do want to position cows better because as you can think through, if you're a, if you're the person coming out here and scraping stalls in this barn, you got a lot of work to get all that manure out. Uh, so we're putting our eggs in the basket of that cow mover, making sure they do their job. And on this farm, they have to do their job on 80% of the stalls. Whereas if we position the cows well, there's only manure maybe in 10 or 15% of the stalls. So it's a big difference just by, thinking through a brisket pipe and a brisket locator. Um, here's a picture of a dairy. Uh, this is not, they only put it on the outside row, but you can see uh, this is a without picture on the left. And then they installed it. Next time I was there, I took the with picture. And you can see not every single cow is positioned well, but it certainly changed the, the dynamics in general, the per, higher percentage of those cows on the, on the right picture with a brisket locator are positioned much better. So a lot less manure in the stalls, the person moving the cows and raking stalls has a lot less um, of a job to do in terms of removing manure out of those stalls. So just less organic matter in the back of that sand stall um, and so less risk of mastitis. So, so a, big, a big deal, something to think about for your dairies. Um, and then the other thing is, is a discussion for your dairies about how we're monitoring bedding levels in the stalls. Um, who is doing that? Who is doing it routinely and are they getting feedback and giving feedback or is it the same person to the better? Because what we see happen is for some dairies, the inside row or the outside row, the stall usage is quite different. And if we bet everything the same, we end up with, with stalls that are low on bedding and other stalls that may have too much bedding. And so we really need to think through and read the stall better, trying to make sure that we put bedding in where it's needed, when it's needed. Um, and that takes some communication channels. And sometimes we got to really facilitate that or help it as the, as the owners or managers of the dairy, making sure that message is going back and forth and we're getting bedding in there um, where we need it. So stalls are well bedded. Certainly some stalls as well, we just can't get enough bedding and we may need to bed another time. Maybe it's an exception to the rule, right? But at least we get move the bedding from always low to up here and then if we bet at the same level, it may maintain it at a better level. But we need another, another you know, betting event in there, even if it's only a temporary one, just to move the bar up higher. And that, that works in some dairies too. You know? um, so it's, it's worth thinking through that. It affects your, all your cows or a lot of your cows. If we got low betting and poor cow positioning, a lot of manure in the stall and more mastitis. Um, so it's certainly worth putting some effort into that area as well. And then last, we're going to kind of end here on, uh, I'll finish up the last few 
15 minutes or so. And we'll talk more, maybe more of a traditional discussion here about high bulk tank cell count and where to go with it. It kind of wraps some of what I talked about up, some of those other opportunity areas. But certainly when we think about high cell count, the overall solution or the long-term solution is that we prevent new mastitis cases, right? Whether that's dry period, whether it's in the parlor, whether it's out in the stalls. But if we prevent those cases, then we don't have to deal with those high cell count cows. And you saw I gave examples, right, where dairies were their cell count totally driven by what was happening out either in the parlor or in the stalls. And so that's what we want to do is figure those areas out and prevent them so we don't have to deal with them. But short term wise, right, we certainly can reduce the high cell count on our bulk tanks by managing the number of high cell count cows in the tank. And how do we do that? We certainly could treat cows, may not be the most economical decision, but we could treat individual quarters of high cell count cows. We can remove them from the tank, right? That may mean drying that individual quarter off or actually taking the cow out. Or, you know, of course, culling is on the list uh, as well, or dry off. If they're early and close enough to dry off, we could take those. But that removes those high cell count quarters. The challenge is if we don't do anything about the new ones coming in, we're just right back in the situation again by the next month. So we really have to focus on prevention. And remember, you know, clinical mastitis, a lot of us see it, we think about it a lot, but it really isn't the biggest problem. The biggest problem on our dairies is subclinical mastitis. The milk looks completely normal. There's no clots, there's no flakes, but it's high cell count milk. So milkers cannot detect subclinical mastitis, right? We have to think about doing it another way. And, and the most common, of course, is that we do, you know, monthly DHI testing so that we test our herd monthly um, and then we know which cows are our high cell count cows. Um, Hands-on, we can also do it right on a small scale by CMT, and it gives us an approximation of those high cell count cows um, by CMT, and that, of course, we can do by quarter. So those are the ways that we detect our subclinical cows, primarily by DHI testing. Um, and then as we're going to think through, like, how are we going to address this high cell count? We need to know what bug we're dealing with. So what, what's the dominant bug on, on the dairy? And for that, we need individual cow cultures. Certainly clinical mastitis cases, we might need some high cell count cows, maybe some fresh cows. Smaller herds, the bulk tank may be predictive, especially if it's a contagious issue. We can see it in the bulk tank. But we need some cultures to know where we go and how do we address your problem because it tells us what bugs are causing it. And, and based on the bugs then, the two big categories, which we've talked about for years, but is about a contagious spread cow to cow or environment coming out of the environment to the cows. And the individual cultures can, can help us to, to nail that down and tell us what it is. If it's contagious, again, the reservoir is the cow. So it's the infected cow, it's milk from that infected cow. And the bugs in that are, are strep ag, which we still see a little, but not much. Staph aureus, definitely still a predominant player. And mycoplasma, um, we definitely see that. In some situations, we'll put prototheca in there uh, and some other bugs occasionally. Um, but those would be our contagious bugs. They spread cow to cow. And the, the contrast or the difference of that is our environmental bugs, where the reservoir of the pathogen is the environment. So it's coming out of, and basically environment means manure, pretty much. All the bugs that we, on this list here, all of them we can find in the manure of cows. We can culture it right out of the manure. And so that's our our dominant source. Occasionally on farms, there's other sources, but but certainly our biggest source is, is the cow manure. And so it's about keeping cow manure away from the tea den when we talk about environmental pathogens. So when we think to the mastitis of the tank, we're, we want to know when is it happening? Is it is it dry period stuff? We talked about that a little bit, or is it during lactating? Right, and the records can tell us that if we look at our if we got DHI testing records, that can tell us. Clinical mastitis records can give us some indication as well. So, and then prevention, right? Again, that's that's the big goal is we're trying to reduce the incidence of mastitis, both clinical and subclinical. And we want to look for those opportunity areas to prevent mastitis on your dairies because that's the biggest bang for your buck. But based on the culture then, we know the organism, we know whether it's lactating or dry cows or both. And then we come and do a targeted risk assessment. So for us, if we're going to come to your dairy and you ask us to come, we're going to do something that looks along this lines. We're going to look at the equipment. We're going to time the people and look at the people and see how they're performing. And then we're going to do a bunch of cow assessments, teat scoring, teat uh, utter hygiene, 
bunch of other cow assessments to assess, is it a cow issue, is it a people issue, or is it an equipment issue? Um, and then we're going to walk the whole stall. We're going to walk the environment. So we're going to look at your stalls and stall management. And that's what we do. And, and based on that risk assessment, then we're going to try to help you do a better job in those areas that are, are the biggest bottlenecks um, and, and hopefully, you know, make it better. And just a reminder, right? So when we talk about contagious mastitis, um, we think about it. We don't want to spread milk from this cow to another cow. So how can we do that? Our hands can do it. Certainly the milking order uh, of infected cows. So we want to milk infected cows last. We can also do it with, with towels. We've seen issues with towels on some dairies if we're not laundering them well um, and drying them well, right? We can take contagious mastitis from this cow and, and send it to the next cow. Post-dipping teats, that's been our thing for years about ways to prevent contagious mastitis is to get the teats dipped because if we transferred something during milking, we dip them with a disinfectant and it kills off what's on the skin before it goes up in the teat canal. And then teat skin health is absolutely critical, right? And so we think about how we're exposing our teats, what we're using. I, looked, I showed you those skin condition issues earlier. Um, certainly the milking machine has an issue on the teat end. It doesn't have a large issue on the barrel skin, but it has a large issue on the teat end health or the hyperkeratosis or bad teat ends. And so that can be about machine settings. And then, um, you know, if we know which cows they are, we want to eliminate them or put them last. And, and for some of these contagious ones, right, we can eliminate them by treating them. Some of them, they have to be cold. And then if we're buying cows or even from our heifer population coming into our dairy, we want to know what they are coming in. So culture them coming in so we don't bring in new contagious mastitis. And we flip flop over to environmental, right? And then it's about the environment. We hit through some of these already, right? But if we talk about the dry and the spring, um, dry period in the spring heifers, it's about the stall and pack, the batting sores, splashing, and then our dry off procedure as I went through at the start of the talk um, is on the table. And during, la during milking time and for environmental organisms, it's about pre-dipping. Is our dip on long enough? Are we cleaning our teats well? We're we getting that manure off the teat, which are the source of the bugs. Liner slips. Are we keeping the floor and the units nice and clean? And then obviously trying to promote good teat end health so that the teat has the best option of fighting off mastitis. And then out there in the stalls, which we already hit on, the bedding and the stall management and, um, and the manure splash. So that's environment and environmental organisms. So we think about it and just wrapping this one up is, you know, we, we really got to prevent mastitis. That's our goal. If we have to have a short term, right, then we take quarters out that are high cell count quarters and it will help our tank go down and um, and we can manage it that way. But that's a short term solution if we don't prevent new infections from happening. So, and then last, I want to spend just, just a couple minutes here um, on, uh, on thinking about how we manage our clinical mastitis cases. Again, remember, when we have a clinical mastitis case, we've lost the bat, right? So we've already lost money. It's just about trying not to lose more money with our cases where we see clinical mastitis. The, the rest of the talk, right, was focused on how we prevent stuff or trying to prevent that mastitis, right? But if it happens, and it does, of course, is we don't want to lose more money by doing inappropriate things for our cows. And one of those things is, right, are we treating cows that do not need to be treated? We spent the last maybe 10 years or so at least um, working on the pathogen-based treatment, which means we, we culture in some way, whether it's on farm or labs or other um, other ways that we're going to culture identify the bug prior to us treating those cows. And that way we don't treat cows that don't need treatment or that don't respond to treatment. And the benefit of that is, right, we take that time that would be the withdrawal time of our antibiotic and we put the cow's milk back in. Remember, none of us are saying, we're all saying if it's clinical mastitis, she stays out of the tank. If it's bad milk and it looks bad, that cow stays out of the tank until her milk looks normal. The savings when you treat with pathogen-based treatment and don't treat negative cows or other cows, right, is you don't have on top of the return to clinical normal mastitis, you don't have the extra withhold time. And so there's less milk discarded and that's where you gain your, your benefit of not treating cows that don't need to be treated. And then the other thing is, are we treating cows for longer than they need to be treated? 
And, um, and that's something to think about um, is because the average cow is going to have three to five days of clinical signs, irregardless of whether if we treat her or not. That's what she has. She shows us mastitis for three to five days, irregardless if we treat her or not. That's what's going to happen. So if we're treating based on clinical signs, right, rather than a protocol, we may be treating some cows too long. And that just means more milk discarded and, and more lost income um, because we're over treating. So certainly that's a work with your herd veterinarian. Think about your protocols, uh, making sure they're appropriate and not and not going too long and not trying to treat cows that we know don't respond or won't respond. And, you know, just to, to bring it back, so last week down at the National Mastitis Council in Dallas, Texas, Dr. Pam Rue, probably a lot of you know her. She does excellent work. Uh, she's in Michigan now. She was in Wisconsin. But she presented uh, and, and kind of made us think again, the industry think. Remember, the majority of your cost of clinical mastitis is milk loss. Remember that the most likely cows to get mastitis on any dairy are your older cows and your high cows. So at peak milk is when a lot of cows get mastitis and they're the older cows. If we look at the data, that's pretty clear. Most dairies, that's true. Um, so when you think about your cost of clinical mastitis, it's on your highest producing cows. Um, and so over treating or unnecessarily treating keeps that milk out some of your highest producing cows keeps it out of the tank, right? So it does influence your bottom line a lot because it's the highest producing cows that you're holding out of the tank. And so it's just worth thinking through those cows, making sure we don't over treat cows um, that really don't need to be treated or that won't respond to treatment. For instance, if she's been chronic, high cell count cow for four months in a row, and she's an older cow, it's unlikely that she's gonna respond to lactating cow antibiotics. Not saying never, right? But it's unlikely on average that she's going to, you know, dramatically respond. So, and then just, you know, this is a graph. Dr. Graham Mean presented this back at an NMC conference in 2004. And I've always kind of liked it because it gives us a pie chart. I'm thinking about mastitis on any dairy. It's always what we call multifactorial or caused by many different factors. It's rare that we find one single thing on a dairy that's causing all the mastitis. And in the different categories, he puts the cow there. So thinking about the cow and the immune status and, and the teat health and that. Milking management would be about people mainly and uh, how they're doing the routine in the parlor. Herd and farm management goes out to the stalls, the bedding, the management of the stalls. And then the milking machine, certainly the settings and what's going on in the parlor with the milking equipment. And, um, and it certainly has an influence, right? And something we want to control. So as we wrap up, and we'll open it up for questions. And remember that with mastitis, these bugs come up through the teat end. They come through the teat end. That's where 99.9% .9 of mastitis comes through the teat end. So we got to remember teat end health is critical. The cow's immune status or nutrition, absolutely critical, right, in terms of fighting it off. Other health events, especially around the time of transition, right, that can predispose or mastitis can add to those. Either way, it's a, it's a bad thing. We think about vaccines, right? It's something we can do for cows. Unfortunately, in the mastitis world, we just don't have great preventative vaccines. We have some that we use, right, to, to make the severity of mastitis less. We just simply don't have huge strides in vaccination compared to, say, respiratory viruses. Um, we just don't see that, that impact with vaccines in the mastitis world. Environmental factors, right? Bedding type and management stalls and alleyways certainly uh, have a huge influence on the risk and the exposure of teat ends to, to manure, basically. And then the bugs, what are the factors in the, about the bugs, which bugs, and what are the types and the virulence? In other words, how, how potent are they? But in a lot of dairies that we work with, it's about people. And many times it's the most important and the most variable thing is how our people are being managed um, and how they are influencing the risk of mastitis on the dairy. And it's not necessarily that they're blatantly doing it wrong. It's just, it may not be that they are educated or they don't know how to do it right. Um, or there's risk, there's there's things that are preventing them from doing it right, even though they might want to do it right for you. So sometimes it's about communication. A lot of times it is. So so that's, that's the people. And then just to recap, you know, we talked about dry and fresh cow mastitis. Thinking through that, we talked about what's in the, the loss of milk and teat damage in the parlor. 
betting management, certainly then loss of premiums. If we can gain milk uh, money from, from getting high, lower cell count milk, we want to do it. And trying not to lose more money with our clinical cases by, by inappropriately treating cows that we know don't respond. So with that, we'll open it up for, uh, for questions and um, see what else we got on the table. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, we do have obviously a lot of questions, a lot of participation in this webinar. Um, before we get into the questions, I just wanna um, uh, thank again our sponsor, uh, Finger Lakes Dairy Services for their sponsorship on this webinar. With their uh, support, we're able to bring to you these programs at no cost. And then, well, I will start with the Q&A. Uh, the first question, question is, what stocking density do you recommend for far off dry cows? So, you know, stocking density is always a bit of a loaded question um, because we have to consider, you know, um, a lot of other factors just than what I want. In, in other words, bunk space, we got to consider, um, you know, how, how your stalls are and how you can manage them and that sort of ideal. Um, you know, dry cows, far off dry cows, you know, we, we can crowd them a little bit because they're, you know, once once they're dried off, their teat canals should be closed. Um, but, you know, getting getting too high up into 150 percent, right, are, are, are definitely too high um, because we want them, we want them at time to lay down. Right. There there are large cows they are full pregnant. Um, so we don't. And then the other assessment for you to think through on your own dairy, right? Because it's it's about alley width too, right? How wide are our alleys? How often are we scraping them? Is is to walk through those dry cows and and determine for yourself, saying, is this is this looks like a mastitis risk factor because of how we're how much density we have. You know, we get out to a lot of dairies early in the morning. I tend to walk stalls early in the morning and, and I walk through a lot of dry cows and, and there's sometimes the manure is very deep in the dry cows and it's not hard to imagine and watching cows splash around that that they're too crowded um, and there's cows standing behind cows waiting to get in and it's a bad, you know, it's a bad environment. So yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think this will be uh, really tied up to our uh, next week's webinar or of yeah. how to manage transition cows, right? But it's definitely tied to the environment. Um, a second question, regarding poor routines, what about the theory that cows will adjust to any type of milking procedure over time? Yeah, so that's a good theory. Um, and, uh, but what I'd say to you is, you know, day after day when we get on these dairies, um, we we can show you we can show you thousands of cows data, you know, that says um, even though cows adjust, they don't adjust to the level that we can get performance on if we do it right. Um, so is it bad? Is it as bad as we might think? No. Sometimes in a very consistent dairy doing it wrong, the data is better than I would think it is. It's still nowhere near where we can get with good performance, right? So. So the 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 discussion is, we've known about how cows let down in the oxytocin for years, um, and it's just about how much you want to compromise it. Right. Yeah. Um, third question: Can consistent low vacuum cause teeth damage? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> in general, the answer to that is if it's outside the parameters that the liner. So for each liner that gets sold to you, you should be able to look and have the dealership tell you there's a range of of what they want that claw vacuum that they want that liner to be in, right? So maybe it's 10 and a half to 12.0 is the range for this liner, right? Every liner is going to be different. The manufacturer tells you that. If you're below that range and repeatedly below it on the average cows, on a bunch of cows on your dairy, right? Then the argument would be is you're not running that liner where it should, which means you might be compromising massage. Um, what I can tell you though, from analyzing a lot of dairies, it is very, very unusual. We had one maybe a month ago where the vacuum was down at uh, at 8.5 average claw vacuum. That's too low, yeah. But that is highly unusual from our dairies. Uh, the majority of times, if we see vacuum out of line, it's too high. So high. Um, the end answer for you, for your dairy is, we got to know what it is. So you got to measure average claw vacuum at peak flow on at least 10 cows that are representative of your cow in your situation. And then you're going to know what your vacuum is. 
They don't have to guess. Yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, what is the optimal pulsation settings? Uh, rate pulsation ratio, BD phases ratio. Yep. Yep. So again, it goes back to the liner, right? So the liner manufacturer gives you those values for the liner you're using. They're going to be different for different liners. So the liner manufacturer should give you and says, this is where we want B and D phase to be, right? Really, we should talk about B and D phase and we should talk about milliseconds of B and D phase because that's that's mm -hmm. that's really it. Um, when we talk about rate and ratio, then it's highly dependent on the volume of shell, how long our hoses are, what pulsators we're using, what brand and and, and a lot of other factors, right? So. But if we talk about B and D phases in milliseconds, then we can compare farm to farm and we can we can get target range. If you want a, you know, a, an industry target range for, for D phase, which is the most critical for massage, it's 200 to 250 milliseconds. That's our target range in general, but it really is driven by your liner. Got it. Uh, now, uh, going back to environmental factors, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any suggestions for farms that are struggling using separated solids and seeing increased somatic cell count uh, resources? Uh, it was it is a well managed farm with well managed separator. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and I assume it's on, on deep beds, but. We could ask that, but I'll answer it as if it is in deep beds uh, manure solid. So <clears throat> we didn't touch on it. I didn't. I didn't address it, but I'll, I'll, I'll quickly touch on it here in, in this. When we think about deep beds, um, if we get the back third of that bed contaminated, right, and we're not managing the back third where the other sits well, um, one of the things is about cow positioning, right? So if we have a farm where there's a lot of poor cow positioning and they're not going to change that by putting a brisket pipe, then we actually need to consider getting that back third out of the back of the stalls on a regular basis and putting in brand new bedding. Because over time, that back third of the stalls becomes heavily contaminated. And there's good data. Nigel Cook has it out of, out of Wisconsin for sand, um, but we've seen it for manure solids. There's a benefit to those dairies with chronic poor cow positioning of, of actually taking the back third of stall of bedding out and replacing it on a somewhat frequent basis. Andy was right. talking about last week at NMC about every six months. And there's other there's other you know numbers, but but it's something we need to think about for manure salads definitely because that back third of stalls can can get to be an issue. Grooming, we didn't spend time on grooming, but grooming is critical with with manure solids and something we need to have on the table um, because it influences it. The other thing, just last point, for dairies with manure solids that manage it well, getting as close as we can to daily bedding seems to be one of the keys, right? So that what's going in there every day is the new stuff and that's what's on the top where the cow's udder lays and that that has helped manure salad dairies actually manage manage those manure salads. And, and obviously the product, of course, good dry matter, not wet manure salads. Right. right? Yeah. Oh, those are excellent points. Um, another one, I'm I'm gonna try to go as many as we can. Uh, um, what type of liners are the best recommended and why? Yeah. So when you think about liners, um, what you have to do in terms of getting the equipment dealer to get you the best liner, right, is you have to define the goals you want for your dairy. So for instance, right, you gotta think about whether you want milking speed at a compromise maybe, or, or, or a little less worried about say liner slips or less worried about cow comfort, right? Or do you wanna be in a situation where you have very good cow comfort, right? But you're not as concerned about line or about milking speed. And, and if you define those goals, and you relay those to your equipment dealer or your person that's selling you the liner, right? They can match that up to your dairy, right? You got to think about dairy size, whether it's all mature cows or all heifers for some reason, or, you know, because teat size makes a difference on liners. Um, and then you got to think about your shutoff, right? How much risk of claw cuts do you have? Um, so what, what your shutoff down there, where it goes to the claw, how do you want that design? If you, if you come to an equipment deal with those things, right, they're going to help you match your liner. And then absolutely critical is that you then set your system up to make that liner work. Because the most common error we see on dairies is not that the liner's failing, 
it's that the system is not set up for correctly for that liner. And that's very, very common um, is we aren't giving the liner the ability of even doing this job because we don't have the claw vacuum and the pulsation set appropriately for this liner. And so that's an encouragement to the dealership that they're going to sell you liners, that they come in and set the system up for that liner, for you, for the goals you want, and then you'll have a liner that works well. Wow. Great points, Paul. Um, next question. Uh, how can we monitor flow rate pattern in the dairy herd? Should we evaluate individual cows or at a group level? And what is the accepted percentage of bimodal cows? Yeah. So um, it it's always good to think in individual cows, right? Because that's really the the impact always is at the individual cow level. Um, and for visual to teach, it's always good. Like I showed you the bimodal graph. So it's always good to think that, but if we're going to manage a parlor and manage milkers, right, we have to manage by groups or we have to manage by the, by all the cows together as a whole, because it, it takes into account everything that's going on. So we're going to, we're going to look at an average, say of two minute milk, um, for the whole milking including all cows, right? And we're going to compare that day to day and milking to milking and different milking shifts, right? As well, sometimes some dairies, um, we're, we're doing it where they're printing out. So say it's a double 30 parlor, right? They're printing out the first one to 10 stalls because that's the first guy, 11 to uh, 20, 21 to 30, right? So they're printing out the reports by each individual person so they can see exactly who's, who's doing what in that parlor. So that that's that gets it down to the people level. It's about people, right? Milking routine is about people and managing and helping to manage people. Um, and so thinking through flow rates. Um, now the question was, what's a good number for um bimodal? For bimodal, yeah, bimodal. Yeah. The number the industry usually throws around and we we talk about is less than 10% bimodal. Certainly we see dairies get better than that. But if we're under 10% of bimodal cows, um on your dairy, you're doing you're doing well, um, and, uh, okay. and better than a lot of other dairies that that have a poor routine that that it might be at fifty percent. I've seen sixty percent, seventy percent of my model dairies. So, wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on the prep routine of Lely's A fives? Would you make adjustments to the presets, and if so, what would you do different? Yeah. So we didn't. We didn't touch on robotics as much here, um, and um, it's it's tough to get into specifics. Um, but what I'd say to you is, you know, when we go into robot herds, we evaluate them pretty similar to what we do regular herds. We don't get as many cow replicates because it's tougher for time, just cost wise for the farm. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly what what one of the things we look at, um, and by looking at the teats and scoring the teats and watching the cows, right. Then we come up with the answer to the question that's being asked is, would we change the presets, right? Um, because it really is about that individual farm, what line are they using, what vacuum they're set at, how they got it set, right? Because all of those influence um, what's happening on that dairy in terms of do we need more stimulation or not? Um, so, you know, rather than, than answering that question specifically, what I'd say is, you know, we'd analyze the farm and then make a decision, do they need it? And, and the farm can do the same, right? Is looking and watching cows, seeing what the teats look like after the units come off and saying, do we have an issue with the way this cow, this robot is prepping these cows? Yeah, it would be a farm specific situation, evaluation, mm -hmm. yep. Uh, then we have, can the neck rail be used if we don't have brisket, brisket locators? Yeah, unfortunately, Unfortunately, the answer is no. We just, I was at a farm meeting here uh, on Monday and, and the farm had come to that same conclusion is the problem with the, the neck rail is, and they had lowered it actually four inches, um, but their statement was as cows laid down, this is exactly what cows do, as cows laid down, they'd lay down, then they'd scoop forward, right? And so the, the neck rail positions them standing in the stall, but does not position cows while laying in the stall. And so the problem is what we end up doing if we, we mess with the neck rail too much is we actually cause more perching, which then, of course, the cow comfort, nutrition, mm -hmm. end of angle, 
and we end up we don't get the cow positioning we want with the lying um, and so I I'm not saying it doesn't have a little bit but the majority of the influence on a cow lying positioning is about brisket locators and and you could do it you sometimes try to do it with bedding levels in the front of stalls like a false brisket board that takes a lot of management too to get cows positioned by a false brisket board but it's um but neck rail unfortunately doesn't do what we want for lying positioning right okay so with this paul thank you so much for this great presentation for taking uh time to come and speak our, our webinar series you're very welcome yeah enjoyed it thank you thank you so much